This video was not supposed to have a question mark in the title. Let's roll the intro. Hey, Vlad here from devinsideu.com. Welcome to another video. I'm recording this one at the end of April 2023 and RC4 is already out. By the time you're watching this, Scala 3.3 is probably fully out. It's the first ever long-term support release, which is supposed to be a big deal. But not so fast. Whenever there is a new Scala release, I look at the release notes and pick out a few things that I like. So we'll go through them real quick before getting to the LTS part. Let's get to it right after the message from our sponsors, scalajobs.com and rustjobs.dev. Check out the links in the description below if you're looking for a job. This video is also brought to you by awesome people like yourself who support me on platforms like Patreon, GitHub sponsors, or the YouTube membership program. Your contributions go right back into this channel. They allow me to pay for a video editor or free some of my time, which I then again spend with you, whether it's during live streams or answering your questions on Discord. There's many of you and only one of me, so all it takes is a dollar. Thank you. All right, the most noticeable change is arguably fewer braces becoming a standard feature. In case you're not familiar, significant indentation has been around since Scala 3.0, but it was limited to things like classes, objects, traits, and a couple of control structures, maybe even all of them, like for comprehensions, pattern matching, ifLs, and you know, probably a couple of other things that I can think of right now. There used to be an experimental flag which would allow you to enable the significant indentation for other things, which I already made a video about. But now that Scala 3.3 is out, this flag is gone. Fewer braces are enabled by default. On one end, I don't want to be that guy, but on the other hand, I told you. What did I tell you? Didn't I tell you? Because I told you. Mm -hmm. And when did I tell you? A long time ago. And what did I say was going to happen when I told you? Exactly what just happened. So fewer braces are enabled by default now, but they're still optional. So if you don't like them, curlies are still around and Scala FMT can insert them for you. I haven't tested how bulletproof Scala FMT is though, you know, when going this direction. The next thing that we're going to talk about is the experimental macro annotations. We all know that macros were changed substantially between Scala 2 and 3. They became safer, but at a great cost. In particular, the macro annotations were gone among other things. It does help to have the derives keyword since deriving type class instances is the primary use case for macro annotations. However, there are other use cases as well, so I'm glad that the macro annotations are making a comeback. Huge shout out to Nikola Stuki for his awesome work on this and many other things. Well done, sir. The next one is value discard, which is a big deal for functional programming. I've shot myself in the foot countless times accidentally calling map instead of flat map, for instance. And in Scala 2, a warning saved me, especially because all of my warnings are fatal. It took a while for it to arrive in Scala 3, and I'm glad that it finally did. Speaking of linting, the unused warnings are back. This is especially useful for the unused import, since this warning is used to guide the organized import Scala fix rule. Lots of false positives on this one, though, even in RC4, which is the one that is currently out, and is the one that I used to prepare this video because Scala 3.3 is not fully out yet. The next one is more of a bug fix. Case classes used to be limited to 22 fields, but this restriction was lifted a long time ago. Well, it turns out that there was a bug around 195. This bug has been fixed now, so we can go all the way to 254. I'm sure that there is at least one of you out there who wants 255 though. Shame on you. The next item on the list is the return of the hyphen y imports flag. In case you're not familiar, every Scala file automatically imports the Java Lang and Scala packages respectively, as well as the contents of the Scala pre-dev object. This flag that's been around for a long time in Scala 2 allows you to modify this list and import something like Zio, for example. Now, there are global exports in Scala 3, but there are subtle differences. Firstly, you can't export packages, which is a limitation in the incremental compiler. And secondly, even if you do use exports, they generate a lot of code. It's a lot of code that you can't see, but it is still there. So if there are warnings and you have fatal warnings enabled, as you should, your code won't compile. And as of right now, you can suppress those warnings. Hyphen Y imports to the rescue. By the way, there are currently ongoing discussions about the optimizations that could be done to exports because currently they generate a lot of bytecode. All right, now a couple of fields in the standard REPL implementation have been made less private and a couple of classes less final, which should greatly simplify the implementation of REPLs like Ammonite and the Scala CLI. Allegedly, with those things open, a REPL can be implemented in around 700 lines of code and there is a new REPL to demonstrate it. I didn't check it out because honestly, I spend around 10 minutes per year in any REPL, but 
I'm glad that there is progress in making things more consistent. Who knows, maybe one day we won't even need competing REPLs. Also, it's worth pointing out that it's not a proper well thought out API. It's more of a workaround for now. So maybe it won't be maintained, maybe it will be changed. You know the drill. The last item on the list before we finally start talking about LTS is the new boundary break control flow abstraction. It's a bit mind bending and I might make a dedicated video about this since it seems to be a stepping stone towards direct style programming. I'm referring to Martin's newly released video of course and if you haven't seen it there will be a link down in the description. Essentially it's a safer way to implement non-local returns. It doesn't look like much. Essentially you mark your scope by calling the apply method on the new Scala util boundary object similarly to how you would mark your scope by using a try block and then if you wish to exit early you call the boundary.break method which simply throws an optimized exception which carries a value. The exception is then handled inside of the boundary, it's caught and the value trapped inside of it is returned. Again I'll try to make a dedicated video about it if I deem it worthy but no promises. Now let's finally talk about LTS. Since the dawn of Scala, the Scala compiler was plagued with binary compatibility issues. Every time a new minor version of Scala came out, you couldn't reliably upgrade to it before all of the libraries were cross-published for it. In other words, the compiler releases were not binary backwards compatible. Thanks to Tasty, the binary backwards compatibility issue is solved. When a new version of Scala 3 comes out, you can just flip the version in your build file and even though all of your dependencies have been built with the earlier version of the compiler, in fact they've never seen this version of the compiler, all of your code magically compiles and often even just works. In fact, if you're moving only within the patch versions of the compiler, even the binary forwards compatibility is guaranteed. For instance, if you're on Scala 3.2.1, but Scala test is already on 3.2.2, the change is only in the patch version, you can still use it. This is also great for library maintainers who now don't need to play the cat and mouse game with the Scala compiler releases. Story time. In fact, I hope I recall this one correctly. Scala test is the most widely used testing library in Scala and whenever a new version of the Scala compiler would come out, nobody could upgrade until Scala test would. The problem was that Scala test also knew how to test Scala.js code and so it was waiting until Scala.js would upgrade to the new Scala compiler version. To make matters worse, back then the Scala.js team consisted only of Sebastian Duran, who was a student at the time. No pressure, am I right? This is ridiculous. The entire Scala ecosystem was depending on one unpaid or at least seriously underpaid student. I'm so glad that we solved this issue, at least for Scala 3. Now this all sounds fantastic, but why do we need LTS versions then? Well, even though both we, the so-called commercial product owners, as well as the library maintainers already benefit greatly from binary backwards compatibility, the library maintainers still have an issue. They don't know which older version of the compiler to target and when the support for it will be dropped. In fact, it would be great if they could leap ahead of us and use the newest Scala compiler version, but they can't, even if we, the so-called commercial product owners, stay within the LTS releases. They have to either use the version we use, independently whether it's the LTS version or not, or they have to stay behind and the LTS version signals to them which version to use, namely the latest LTS one. For instance, assuming that Scala 3.3, which is the first LTS release, is out, and it should be out by the time you're watching this video, and I wanted to publish a new library, whether I want to publish it today, in a year, in two years, or in three years, I will target the 3.3 release from potentially three years ago. By the way, to be crystal clear, the entire 3.3.x line is LTS, not just 3.3.0. So as a library author, I can stay on the LTS versions for years and only upgrade when the new LTS version comes out, which would be 3.7 or something, without feeling like I'm abandoning my users. In fact, as a commercial product owner, you might as well wish to stay on the LTS versions and benefit greatly from the stability of the compiler and the surrounding tooling ecosystem. Essentially, the compiler team promises to stick to semantic versioning and keep the innovation within the patch versions of the LTS releases to the minimum as it always should have been, honestly. Essentially, you can treat the Scala compiler the same as any other dependency. And so the TLDR is that you get stuck on some version of the compiler for some reason or the other. And so now that we have LTS releases, if you do get stuck, it better be on the LTS version. Now, the reason there is a question mark is the title is because when I first heard of the upcoming LTS releases, I was hoping for a true binary forward compatibility, meaning that the library authors would be able to use the newest version of the compiler and we could stay behind, but as long as we stay on the LTS version, we would be able to use those libraries. But unfortunately, that's not the case. 
And so my question to you is, do you think LTS is a big deal? In my opinion, even though we didn't get all the bells and whistles, it's good enough. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Really, I rarely ask for comments, but this time I'm genuinely curious. In any case, I hope you enjoyed this one. Check out the previous one and I'll see you in the next one. For now, as always, it's been Vlad from DevInsideYou.com. Don't forget to like this video if you did, subscribe if you want to improve the developer inside you. And if you wish to contribute to tech education, please consider doing so on platforms like Patreon, GitHub sponsors, or by clicking the join button below the video. And watch my videos before everyone else. And most importantly, take care.